and I founded the, the, the sociology school of economics. Then I was uh, moved to the S school of economics where sociology was located. And since then, I have been um, uh, at school of economics uh, teaching sociology. Then I found the uh, research center in 1978. Uh, and um, from uh, 1984 onwards, I spent most of my time in the United States, in fact, half year in the United States, in the University of Wisconsin, Madison, uh, teaching or doing research the fall term from August to December. And, um, and the rest of the time, uh, in fact, I was not very much at the center. I was most of the time uh, traveling. Um, so that has been my, my life was as far as your first question is concerned. And uh, what about the academic role models? Did some like Foucault, Chomsky, Marx, Gramsci, did touch your soul or? Well, uh, in, in fact, uh, at the time was basically Marx was a very uh, great influence. Not when I was in, uh, in West Berlin, because in West Berlin, it was impossible to, to do that. Uh, because I was, uh, there was, at the time there was a wall the Berlin Wall, and uh, my girlfriend, in fact, lived in the in Ost, and uh, in on the other side, and I would cross the wall very often because we foreigners could cross the wall without any problem if you didn't stay for more than twenty four hours. And what I saw on the other side uh, was not good. Uh, I really, I was coming from a dictatorship. Portugal was then a dictatorship when uh, as. Uh, as you know, until 1974. And what I saw on the other side was, uh, of course, very different, but in any case, uh, also a loss of the freedom and so on. So that was not the kind of, of the regime. So I became a Marxist, uh, a Marxist at Yale. It was at Yale that we, I started my systematic studies of uh, Marxism, um, always in a very heterodox way, that is to say, not Althusserian, not uh, very dogmatic, but uh, on the contrary, very open to other types of, uh, of uh, philosophies. Um, and at the time, in fact, a great uh, cultural revolutionary, uh, a very polemical one, of which I was a very good friend, called Ivan Illich. Uh, he was Austrian, actually. He, he was a priest, actually, a Catholic priest that used to be a priest in New York, and then moved to Cuernavaca and founded uh, a center uh, for uh, democracy, human rights, uh, uh, education, very revolutionary in terms of ideas, and also a very good place where we could meet uh, wonderful people. Many of them were refugees from the dictatorships in Latin America. But there was a time in which I also met other great intellectuals, uh, like André Gors from France, uh, with whom I taught uh, a course together called Law and Revolution. Uh, so that was uh, probably elite, even though he was not a Marxist. In fact, uh, I had lots of debates with him because uh, I didn't share many of his ideas, but he was a brilliant mind. Um, and I had a debate going on on topics of education, and I was very much interested because I was uh, very influenced also by another person, a Brazilian pedagogue, uh, Paulo Freire. Paulo Freire had a famous debate with Ivan Illich uh, because Paulo Freire wanted to keep the, uh, our schools, but to reform them while uh, uh, Ivan Illich wanted a, a total de-schooling, as he called it. That is to say, education should be done by parents, communities, uh, you know, workplaces, and not formal education. So uh, as you can see, some of these ideas that seemed very revolutionary were appropriated later on by the extreme right forces. So it, I, I saw always this danger from the very beginning, and therefore there were many debates and, uh, and stuff. Well, very interesting, yes. Um, so, um, in a in the philosophical seminar, um, 
the university in Vienna, uh, uh, led by Sophie Feigl. We did read, uh, read your book, um, Epistemologies of the South, and there you touch power structures, hierarchies, and knowledge production and the epistemicide. Um, and uh, I have to say a, a big shout out to Sophie uh, and uh, the colleagues. Uh, we read your book. We had wonderful discussions on, um, yeah, what to do with this book. <laughs> uh, and um, yeah, on this point, um, a big shout out to all the colleagues. Um, and now, uh, with having this in mind, um, how do you became interested in 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 power structures, hierarchies, and and um, you get the impression that um, you have um, the 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 motive to to yeah to change the world. How how is that? Uh, you know. Um, how can you explain that? Um, is it because you are from Portugal, a former empire? Uh, is it because of your family roots that, that you talked about, um, uh, working class family? Um, how can you explain that? Well, Joseph, I, there were lots of explanations. Of course, for someone that comes from the, the working class background, the questions of power or powerlessness is always there. Uh, and um, and in fact, I was uh, uh, very much struck by power structures of different kinds, not just uh, uh, based on capital, but on, on, on something else, on uh, on identity problems, on racism, uh, on uh, the intellectual, on colonialism in general. In fact, I live very intensely. I was a member of the anti-colonial movement because, you know, the Portuguese colonies lasted until uh, 1975. So when, when, when I was in Berlin, uh, in West Berlin, I was in a, a, a Catholic again mind, um, because at that time I was a Catholic. And, um, and in fact, I gave my, my first lecture, in fact, was against uh, colonialism. Portugal, uh, das Erbe des Colonialismus. And it's very interesting because that's lect le 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 that lecture uh, was attended by the SDS students, as you know, were very radical students in Berlin in the 60s that, in fact, started the student movement. And they were in my in my lecture uh, uh, ready to denounce me uh, because since I was Portuguese, they thought that I would be defending uh, Portuguese colonialism. Uh, but, uh, of course, I was not. I was, in fact, very critical of it. And uh, at the end of the lecture, they came to me and they invited me to, to join the SDS, the, the, the Socialist uh, Deutsches Bundes. But, uh, you know, I was a foreign student. I was not supposed to join German uh, associations and I refused. But we became very good friends then. So the question of power was very important to me, but uh, what the TIL you know, at, uh, at, at the end of the six, uh, the, 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 the 60s or mid 60s, uh, late 60s, in fact, 69, when I arrived there, there was, uh, you know, the questions of power were everywhere in the US. Uh, was a wonderful society for critical thinking at the time. There was the, the, all the demonstrations against the Vietnam War, was the civil rights movement, was the Black Panther power. So I was very much concerned with racism uh, and anti-colonialism. And that's why um, uh, uh, when I studied Marx, in fact, Ma Marx was short for me in the sense that could not cover all the types of um, type of dominations and power structures that I was uh, analyzing in the world. And um, then when I decided to do my field research, for my thesis, for my PhD thesis, I decided to do a qualitative study by doing a participant observation, which is one of the sociological method, uh, methods. And I, I decided to live in one of the slums in Rio de Janeiro, favelas, as they are called. And I lived there for several months. Uh, in fact, the same city where my, my grandparents had been immigrants. Um, 
And I was, uh, uh, during that period, living among those people, I also became, became very much interested in all the other structures, not just of uh, capital, most of them were workers, uh, 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 very low salaries and so on, but it was a dictatorship then in Brazil, a military dictatorship. Uh, racism was rampant, and um, so I could see all the different structures of power, and besides, I could see how myself coming from an elitist uh, type of university like Yale, uh, I had such a privilege. My, my knowledge was a kind of a privileged knowledge, and so I became very much interested in the epistemologies. In fact, the roots of the epistemology of the South come from there, because I lived in the favela during this period, and uh, since I was not, not able or not, not allowed, in fact, to, according to my method, to do interviews, there was just conversations all day round with people, with the carpenters, with shoemakers, with the bartenders, with the people there in the shops, in the, on the street, in the festivals, and so on. And I could see so much wisdom, so much knowledge coming out of those minds, of those people, uh, even though some of them were illiterate. But that knowledge, which later on I became to know, say, as vernacular knowledge, um, popular knowledge, were not, uh, uh, you know, considered as such. In fact, they, they, there was no knowledge from my point of view, uh, from the point of view of the, the, the epistemologists that I had studied at Yale, because uh, they didn't have knowledge, they had information. And uh, knowledge, I was the one, as uh, the subject of knowledge, they, uh, they were objects of knowledge. They could provide information, but not knowledge. And that became very disturbing for me. Uh, and when I wrote my dissertation, I already accounted for that um, disturbance and said, well, there's something wrong here. And I want to get more and more profound uh, ideas on this. So the epistemology became there. But as I did that, I also, in uh, you know, giving more uh, depth reflections on Marxism, I could see that Marx was con really concerned. Marx didn't know much of the rest of the Europe, of, of the world. He knew Europe, in fact, he knew very well England, uh, not so much the UK, not so much the rest of Europe, and basically nothing of the rest of the world. He knew a lot, in fact, for that time, through the news or through the type of, of information, was a remarkable scholar. But in fact, at that time, 90% of the world was either a colony or uh, of Europe or under influence of Europe, like uh, uh, China after the first uh, opium war of 1839. So uh, it was a world that everything was centered on Europe. And in Europe, the most developed country, of course, was uh, uh, the UK. Uh, so I, I noticed that it, it would be impossible. Uh, so I came up, first of all, with the idea that, uh, in fact, the main dominations of our world were not just capitalism, but also colonialism and patriarchy. The idea, in fact, it was a, a Marxist theory based on Marx, uh, but re-elaborating the theory. The idea that uh, capitalism uh, could not survive without colonialism. And uh, historical colonialism has ended with independences, but uh, not uh, colonialism in itself. It continued under reforms, neocolonialism, internal colonialism, colonial, coloniality, as uh, Anibal Kihan called it. So there were different forms of colonialism. Why is that so? Well, because capitalism and the Karl Polanyi show that very clearly in the Great Transformation, the book of 1944, that uh, if the companies would to pay all the work that is really involved in the, in the factories, um, they will not be profitable. Uh, for instance, the non-paid work labor by the women at home, caring of the family, uh, which we call Marxist, even call them reproductive labor, even though it is a very productive labor, in fact, produces life, uh, more productive than probably the work in the factory, 
uh, and also highly developed labor, like the slave labor, uh, like the immigrant labor. And uh, so uh, primitive accumulation, as Rosa Luxemburg had defended, uh, was a permanent characteristic of, uh, of, uh, of capitalism. And therefore, capitalism could not survive without colonialism and patriarchy. And I can tell you that I'm more convinced today than I was then uh, about this. I think of this, uh, these different uh, 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 dominations. Then came the, the World Social Forum in 2001, and I was one of the main activists of the World Social Forum. And uh, then I could see thousands and thousands of people coming from different kinds of, uh, of, uh, of regions of the world. Different, different narratives uh, of struggle, different repertoires of domination, uh, different ideas, yeah. non-Western Western. cosmologies, non-West philosophies, and all that impressed me a lot. Uh, and then I could see that uh, these peoples, they have really other kinds of knowledges. They were not just informants, they were knowledges. And my epistemologies were really very, very narrow-minded by considering that science is the only rigorous knowledge. <clears throat> of course, <clears throat> I never yeah, went to the extreme of some decolonial uh, scholars that in a sense uh, criticized uh, uh, altogether science, modern science as a colonial yeah. science. I never did that because I learned with a great liberator of the Portuguese colonies called the Milk of Cabral that we should be selective that science is a precious uh, instrument of knowledge, even for liberation, but it's not the only valid knowledge. It's a valid knowledge, but not the only one. There are other valid knowledges in the world. And the knowledge of the South, in fact, come from there, to the recognition of the other knowledges, particularly the knowledges born in struggle. Uh, the peoples in the South, the global South, that have been struggling against the capitalism colonialism and patriarchy, men, women, indigenous people, black, Afro-descendants, and all this has such a richness that has been kept out of much, much of our either functional sciences or even Marxist uh, modern science, very much Eurocentric. So that became the, the topic for my, so I had a very broad conception of power, uh, it was not Foucault, and I, I think that, of course, I read yes. Foucault, uh, as okay. everyone in the 70s, during critical thinking, uh, would have in the critiques of uh, uh, the old structuralism, but I could never uh, uh, understand that uh, uh, resistance is also a kind of uh, form of power, and, uh, and if it is a form of power, uh, therefore, we cannot get rid of power because resistance itself is a form of power. And secondly, because it was very Eurocentric, because it was a disciplinary knowledge based on disciplinary knowledge, based on human sciences and how the states have developed these forms of control and centralism. Well, if you look at the world, this is very, a very <laughs> narrow story. It's the story of Europe, of some countries in Europe of some countries in Europe, not even uh, the total Europe coming from Portugal. I never saw the disciplinary knowledge as developed as he saw it. Uh, so it was very narrow minded. And uh, in fact, we should really expand it uh, to other, other forms uh, of, uh, of power. Uh, but in fact, that was the idea that was behind me. Uh, and also a critique of all the the deconstruction type of process, uh, you know, uh, led in part by, by, by Derrida, by Gilles Deleuze, great scholars, great philosophers, of course, but within uh, the European uh, narrative of knowledge, uh, never beyond that. And sometimes uh, very dangerous for the people that are in struggle because they were so critical that in fact could give the idea that resistance is not possible because after all, power is everywhere. If power is everywhere, it's nowhere. Uh, so it became very problematic for me. And that's why I had to break with this tradition 
and to, to bring in the epistemology of the South, first in that book that you read, and probably more systematically in the end of the Cognitive Empire, my 2018 book by Duke University Press, because there I have the three moments of my, of my proposal. Uh, the first moment is the epistemology, the second is the methodology, and the third is pedagogy. So I have the three areas in which I, I interact. Very interesting. Maybe we can we can uh, I ask you later about your criticism on Frankfurt School and 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 post uh, structuralist um, um, theoreticians and and schools. Um, but first, I want to ask you uh, for those people that are watching that are not knowing. Um, please explain us why do you think that there is in this modern liberal self-declared international community and then the, the you know developed uh, world um why is in this capitalist system so much oppression and and uh, why don't we see it uh or many of my austrian <laughs> fellows here here and um where and how can we see these modern forms of oppression mm, because you know Uh, when you read uh, uh, liberal intellectuals like Steven Pinker, you get the impression that everybody is, is happy and, and we are like theologically going forward and there is a progress, technological progress, health uh, and, and so on and so forth, economic growth and, and many other things. So please explain us uh, on a, yeah, how and why is there oppression in our system? Well, it is oppression because when you look, for instance, I did a study, a book on the, on the pandemic, and you, you can now read it. It is published by Routledge, and it's called uh, From Pandemic to Utopia, The Future Begins Now. So in this book, uh, I see, where I study, uh, the mortality rates, the idea that this is a global pandemic, And how are we going to, uh, you know, deal with it? Uh, it is a global threat. But if you look carefully uh, in one of the chapters, I look at uh, the ways in which, uh, in fact, the mortality rates uh, reflect precise all the oppressions and inequalities and aggravate them. Uh, For instance, violence against women increased with the pandemic. Racism increased with the pandemic. Uh, then you have all uh, these inequalities in the mortality rates according to the economic status of the people. You know, black people, for instance, in the United States died much more than white people in proportion, so to say, right? Uh, poor people more than rich people. And then you have this scandal of in, in, in uh, under the rhetoric of globalization, which apparently is that there is no oppression because we are all interdependent, all of a sudden in a pandemic, you, you come with uh, vac vaccine nationalism. That is to say, uh, the vaccines are developed by the Northern countries and uh, you and me, we can be vaccinated four, six times, but the rest of the world cannot. Why can they cannot do that? Well, because the big farm, they have five companies, uh, big pharma, uh, they have patent rights. And we do not allow ourselves, there were no protests, uh, to uh, relinquish, to renounce to the patent rights uh, so that South Africa, uh, Uganda, India, Indonesia, these were the countries with capacity to produce masses of vaccines and efficient vaccines. So oppression, uh, uh, you can see, is always visible in uh, all these inequalities of the, of the world. And they don't happen outside Europe. They happen inside Europe. Uh, for instance, you saw the elderly people, all the elderly people were dealt with during the pandemic. In one case in Spain, in Madrid, they found several hundred people, elderly people, dead in a, in a residence. They were, they were left abandoned by, by someone. Nobody knew. And when the military people came in, they, they were all dead. That is to say, because they were elderly, 
uh, they were abandoned. So this uh, uh, comes to my idea, which is crucial to my, all my thinking of the Abyssa line. Uh, there, is, uh, uh, there is no humanity in our societies. Uh, for us to be human, the, the two of us and many of us that are following us, others are treated as subhumans. And, um, and you can show you this Abyssa line between the human and subhumans is part of precisely the fact that colonialism and patriarchy racializes bodies, sexualizes bodies that are devalued. And therefore, they have no value compared to the fully human beings. Uh, if, and if you need examples, uh, look at uh, the boat with 700 people that sank in the Asian Sea recently. Well, there was no crisis in Europe. There was no problem. The, the media didn't pay much attention. 700 people probably. But then there is uh, the submarine of the very rich people uh, looking for the Titanic. They are five people. They are very important people. Every country is going to help them to save the submarine. Every all the media attention is, uh, you know, focused on them. What about the seven hundred? Well, seven hundred are subhumans. Are treated as subhumans, so they are not the same value, and therefore they are forgotten. So this idea of humanity and subhumanity, or less than humans, as they are treated. Of course, they are full humans, but in that book, uh, I also showed that these uh, subhumans, treated as subhumans, are full of knowledge. So one chapter of the book is about the initiatives by the people in the slums, by the indigenous people, to protect their lives, using, for instance, uh, traditional medicine. Uh, the traditional medicine, of course, cannot produce vaccines, but they produce immunity. There are lots of herbs that improve the immunity of our bodies, and they have done that they protect themselves the, in brazil they protect their communities against the fake news coming from the president of the republic an extreme right guy at the time jair bolsonaro so you know there are lots of other knowledges that were circulating and uh, and these are the knowledges uh, were knowledges that uh, uh, would counter uh, many of the official knowledge by the the world health organization because asking the people to to wash their hands very often when they don't have water to to just to drink in many countries in many parts of the world or to cook is almost an hypocrisy and so they have to find other ways to protect themselves so this diversity is what i think uh, you can see the oppression but you don't see it <laughs> because the world is uh, uh, organized in such a way that we don't see it very well. I'm, I'm not sure that you see it in Vienna. Uh, you know, uh, Metternich, one of your, uh, you know, uh, uh, politicians in the 18th century, I think it was 18, he said that the Asian uh, began in Landstrasse. Landstrasse at the time were, was the, 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 the street where the, the Balkanic people, immigrants from the Balkans, they were Muslim, most of them, uh, lived. So for him, uh, beyond the Landstrasse was Asia, was not Europe anymore. So you see that uh, we have always been doing this type of distinctions. And um, it was not just in the 18th or 19th century, it's, it's right now. But in order to do that, you have to uh, abandon your media, usual media in your uh, journals, periodicals, and you have to look for other information and stay with the people and and be part of the struggle. Absolutely, yeah, I totally agree. And when I read the book of Judith Butler, she um, divides uh, these two categories, victims and collateral damage. And then she asked the question, how is it that, uh, yeah, <laughs> uh, we look at some bodies at, yeah, uh, oppressed bodies and, uh, yeah, and so on and so forth. So, yeah. This idea I, I got from Judith Butler and uh, yeah, I, I believe that I, I can see here the parallels. Yeah. In many lectures, um, you spoke about an interesting thing that um, 
I also experienced in my days um, when I was more active in social movements. Um, there are many social movements fighting these uh, kinds of oppression that you mentioned, racism, sexism, uh, uh, capitalism, and so on and so forth. But they are not united. And I asked myself, we are almost the 99%, we can say. Uh, and how is it that we are the majority and we are oppressed? <laughs> how, how, what, what kind of system is this? And is it, why is it? Yeah. yeah. It's unlogical for us. And uh, there you pointed out um, that this contradiction and, and, and yeah, I, 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 I get a lot from this idea. So uh, please explain us why and how are we divided in these struggles? You know, fe feminism is mobilized against the colonial uh, struggles and uh, vice versa and so on and so forth. Please explain us this concept. Well, sometimes I have a sense that uh, I myself contributed to the creation of a monstrosity, a monster, because what we did from the World Social Forum onwards was to show the plurality of the dimensions of domination. Domination was not just about class, was about race, was about gender, was about public religion, uh, in the case of uh, was caste in India, uh, were many other ageism, ableism, for instance, what, uh, uh, there were other kinds of dominations. And in fact, we were trying in the World Social Forum to celebrate the ways in which you could bring together our struggles. Because I always saw the drama of our, and the tragedy actually of our time, is that I saw very clear in my studies, as I did with this last book, uh, which is just now published in 2023 on the pandemic, that uh, domination always act, acts uh, articulated, in articulation. For instance, I demonstrate in the book that once in Brazil, for instance, capitalism became more aggressive with the extreme right uh, uh, government, uh, immediately more racism uh, came up. Uh, racism increased more feminicide increased. That is to say, domination is always articulated. Capitalism with colonialism, which is, uh, of course, one of the facets of uh, racism and so on, and, uh, and uh, patriarchy. So they, 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 uh, they work together, but the resistance is fragmented. And that's the, tra the tragedy. And is today more fragmented than ever. Uh, and I think that's, that's the situation in which we are. And I think that for that, neoliberalism played a very important role. Because neoliberalism, in, in fact, tried to destroy the capacities of our uh, uh, unity or the possibilities of our unity. First of all, because it uh, created the idea of uh, uh, possessive individualism, something that was old, but became much more strong. Now, the idea that what counts are the individuals, not the communities, not the people. And the individuals are autonomous. The idea of false autonomy, as, uh, as we saw in the, uh, the, precarian, the precariat uh, in the labor relations, uh, or they call flexibility, which is nothing else but just uh, 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 labor without rights. Uh, the uberization of the economy, as we saw it, is always celebrating the individual, celebrating the body, celebrating the power of autonomy without conditions to be autonomous. Because what, they are, what are the conditions of autonomous? Autonomy for the people that deliver food to our houses, right? They are autonomous in a sense. They are not employees, except in England now. They, the, the, these people are already, uh, the deliveries are already unionized, but they are considered autonomous collaborators. Uh, they are uh, entrepreneurs, so to say, right? At the same time, uh, they have no alternative. And if they don't deliver, and I saw them in Brazil and uh, in Colombia and many countries, delivering food every day and uh, they are hungry <laughs> while delivering food all the time. 
So it, it is amazing how neoliberalism uh, eliminate the idea of social responsibility and replaced it by the idea of guilt, uh, individual guilt. And therefore, it also contributes to the division of the struggles. The idea that my struggle is more important than your struggle. And I think that the identity struggles became very important while the class struggles almost disappear. Uh, for instance, the word capitalism disappeared from uh, from our books, not just from the news. Uh, what we have in markets, the economy is about markets, not about capitalism. The, the, the very hey. word disappeared. So the power structures of capitalism also disappear. And identity, uh, for instance, became very prevalent uh, because in a sense, uh, separated uh, from the struggles and tie against colonialism and against capitalism, uh, it is uh, uh, absolutely compatible to neoliberalism. In fact, it can favor neoliberalism agendas and even extreme right agendas. So I, I think that's the situation in which we are now. Uh, and uh, I even wrote a, a book, which is not available in English, but also in uh, only in Portuguese, Spanish, and Italian, uh, Lefts of the World Unite, uh, the idea that, uh, you know, uh, echoing uh, Marxism workers of the world unite, lefts of the world unite. And it was based on experience that we had in Portugal, in which uh, two left uh, parties managed to succeed to govern the country for a while, uh, as they have done in up until now in Spain. But you see that all these coalitions are falling apart. Uh, and in fact, the extreme right is gaining power everywhere, and the left is being divided more and more. So both in political terms and in terms of social struggles, we see more and more fragmentation, uh, dogmatism and so on. And therefore, I think this uh, plays, uh, uh, you know, in the power structures, in the benefit of the power structures, because once we are divided, uh, then, uh, you know, the power goes on as, as ever, probably. Uh, more seriousness, we're more serious now than than before. Absolutely, absolutely, and this division mm, frightens me because um, it is understandable on a personal level, uh, from my experience. Because um, I did, for example, an interview with an, uh, a scholar uh, who does research on femicide, and uh, she, in the end, I asked her, "How do you cope mentally with always looking at these uh, tragic events?" And then I asked her do you hate men and she answered quickly yes so i understand her on a personal level but she hates me as well so it's it's kind of uh you know i i want to give her room to to explain to an audience how you know uh, what is femicide and and you know so in order to support us to unite us your fight is my fight and uh, you know and i can feel and see the division and it's unfortunate uh and yeah, I understand it on a personal level, uh, but yeah, on a strategic level, it makes uh, us weaker in in the yeah, in the transformation of society. Yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. Yeah. Um, so let's maybe uh, move on to the next question. Um, so you always said that we need new forms of knowledge. And in the class, in the philosophical class, uh, when we discussed the book, um, there arose the, the, the debate that for, for hours we, we, we did debate the question on, is it really that there is a lack of knowledge? Because when I look, for example, I'm sitting here in Vienna and in, from my Austrian perspective, um, I don't believe that, that there is a lack of knowledge. If you ask somebody on the streets, do you know how your cell phone is made? And do you know how many children are suffering from the lithium, cobalt, etc.? The, the, the resources, how they are yeah, uh, ex extracted and so on and so forth. And most of them, I believe, know that. And, and it's more, and I am on this side that it's not knowledge that is lacking. It's the political and individual will, especially for the privileged ones, especially those who are living in the global north. 
and especially the privileged one, the middle and upper classes in the global south. They, what is their incentive to change the system? I mean, the system is running for me. I'm white. I'm a young male. I'm, you know, living in, in the global north, in Austria, a former empire. So everything is, is working in, you know. <laughs> why, why, why should I change something? <laughs> well, and well, and I... capitalism is tasty. I can go to the mall. It's tasty. I can eat my hamburger. It's, yeah, capitalism tastes very good. <laughs> yeah. No, that's true. It's, and it's becoming more and more and more difficult but you know um it is true uh, that some of the movements uh, if you look at uh, several movements in the world that transformed the world in, in fact they didn't start by the people that were suffering most from oppression uh, in fact they started from uh, privileged classes that sometimes uh decided for some reason and that we can investigate why it was possible that for instance it wasn't just the type of uh, benefits that they had i give you two examples the first example is the anti-slavery movement well the, the anti-slave of course the slaves always revolt against slavery we have the maronage uh, or quilombo uh, 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 system which were their resistance uh, uh, fleeing from uh, uh, their slave owners and building liberated zones, as I call them in my epistemology, called the quilombos or the maronage. Uh, well, the anti-slavery movement, in fact, uh, started with people that were not slaves. They, they were people in the middle classes, educated middle classes in the 19th century, uh, already 18th century, but then 19th century, that really starts saying that, you know, it's degrading that we have people that we own people. They are not, they are commodities. They are treated as commodities. And of course they did that, and uh, they did that with, together with slave organization by the slaves themselves, and of course also benefiting from the anti-colonial liberation movements and so on, but you saw that these people, in fact, mobilized for, for other struggles. Why was that? Well, a sense of injustice, a sense that, in fact, yes, I, I'm, I'm not going to abandon my benefits, but in fact, all this is uh, that I have at the cost of so many people that cannot afford what I can afford. And therefore, I uh, would probably uh, struggle for them to have access to the same type of goods, and if not the, exactly the same type, at least a little bit. And we should struggle for that. But what we need for that? Well, the second example is a, even a better example, is the nihilist movement of the 1860s in Russia. And this is one of the most fascinating uh, movements uh, which then is going to be very much connected with anarchism, in which the privileged youth, young people, nobles, many of them nobles, uh, from the nobility, decide to change clothes, go to the village, work with the peasants, uh, have the same clothes of the, as the peasants, work with the peasants, uh, live with the peasants, uh, and in fact do away, separate themselves, uh, from uh, their elders and for their families. Uh, it was quite remarkable. You cannot explain what happened later in Russia without the 1860s, uh, at the time of the emperor Alexander II, uh, how this movement developed, uh, anarchism and so on. So we have Michael well, Kropotkin was a prince, so was a very noble person and ended up going from prison to prison in Europe because he was an anarchist. So I think there was a time in which these people really, coming from privileged status, they could in fact engage in struggles with other people. This solidarity, in my view, has always been quite instrumental and quite necessary. Um, in, my, in my work, I always uh, uh, speak about the necessary alliances between 
the people that are abyssally excluded, uh, that's the people of uh, subject to colonialism and patriarchy or hetero patriarchy, and the people not abyssally exclude, exclude like workers. That is to say, they are full human beings, they have rights, rule of law, they have democracy, but they are excluded and more and more so because our societies are very unequal this time. So you can see that, in fact, if you look at this uh, union, it would be very important, um, but it's always a task, a historical task. I have to tell you that when we organized the World Social Forum in 2001, the trade unions didn't participate. Why? Because they thought at the time that they were the only important struggle, the struggle of the workers in trade unions. What about women? What about black people? About the indigenous people? Well, that's, they're not important. So it took a long time to make them believe that they were as important struggles. So I think that uh, uh, neoliberalism has been working very, very hard to separate us one from the other and to uh, be able that the struggles that used to be very important are not important anymore. And uh, since we are more and more divided, uh, more and more individualized, then uh, become what become uh, difference become indifference. Uh, that is to say, you you can see the difference with you know all these people that you see in the world. You can read the news or the people that uh, drown in the Mediterranean, but we experience that with a certain sense of indifference. I mean, you know, the world is like this. I think neoliberalism has naturalized uh, social inequality to such an extent uh, that people, in fact, uh, 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 accept it, in a sense, as a fatality. And then they go uh, for philosophies that are Hyper individualist like uh, Peter uh, Sloverdijk and others in Germany that really, you know, play the individuals as the only entity in the world, and they are, you know, monads in Leibniz, in Leibniz sense. That is to say, uh, solely uh, isolated identities without much connection with uh, the world. Uh, and this is creating all problems, as you know, with the youth, with the questions of burning out, with uh, the increase in suicide and everything that is part of the same narrative. Absolutely. And uh, three years ago, you held a lecture on decolonializing the university and the, uh, the Nelson Mandela University in South Africa. And there you quoted, um, uh, it was remarkable, there are people who doesn't want to remember and then there are people who cannot afford to forget. And this is, uh, remembers me of Sandra Harding, a feminist scholar, feminist standpoint theory. Uh, she also said something like that, similar like that, that the oppressed one, had, um, they have um, more to gain uh, by knowing the system, by knowing how the society works. So, and the oppressor is less interested in, in, in getting this knowledge, you know, to flow. So... Yeah, uh, that was a, a remarkable idea that um, I totally share. Yeah, so knowledge and the production, reproduction of knowledge is, is, is very important. And um, then you, you moved on and said that we know uh, the, the knowledge of the, of the winners, so to speak. Uh, because if you hear the liberal narrative, the end of history, Kuyama and Huntington and many more, so oh, okay, there is no fight going on. There is no class struggle. We are. This is the end. This is no no struggle is needed. And um, yeah, this is this is also yeah on an epistemical level. I can see the fight. So here it it makes it it really makes sense the 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 hegemonic epistemology to to yeah to counter it. Yeah, here I totally understand you. Yes, um, with the term. You often use it, um, especially in the book uh, Epistemologic, uh, uh, Epistemologists of the South, um, you uh, use the term counter-hegemony. I'm not very happy with this term. 
uh, here I see your Marxist roots, uh, because, um, you know, but I, I see the danger that uh, what does counter hegemony means? Does it mean, okay, now we are the new hegemony, you know? So um, uh, isn't it a danger in forming an avant-garde intellectual elite that, okay, now we are the left intellectuals, we are saying what is right, what is wrong? So I'm a little bit skeptical of the term. I prefer anti-hegemony, and and uh, here I am on the on the same page with, for for example, John Holloway and many anarchists. Um, <laughs> no, I, I, well, I well, thank you for that questions. I have the same debate with John Holloway myself. Uh, great person. Uh, no, you know, I, I the, what what you have to. To see is that the, the idea of counter hegemony, in my case, is always used together with two other concepts. I never use it uh, in isolation. Uh, the other concept is the concept of ruined seats, ruined seats, and the other is liberated zones. So these are the three sociology of emergencies, as I identify them. That is to say, with which tools can we conduct a struggle? Whenever we want to conduct a struggle, we need tools, we need instruments, theoretical instruments and so on, and instruments that are at hand. And uh, I see the counter hegemony is uh, the way in which we can use hegemonic instruments against the oppressor. Uh, how do we do that? What are hegemonic instruments? Democracy, uh, rule, rule of law human rights, all these are part, in my view, of oppression. Uh, but they are hegemonic in the sense that they very much are uh, subscribed at Gramscian's idea by the people that are most hurt by these ideas. So hegemony is really a, a bad word for me. But suppose that we use uh, human rights rhetoric and argument to fight against some oppression, if at that time is the only possible tool that I can resort to. Well, in that case, that tool is used counter hegemonically. My example, always come, my, my examples come from my uh, field work and struggles. Uh, uh, indigenous people, there is no concept of human rights within the languages of the, 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 the indigenous people. This is a concept that does not exist. Nevertheless, they sometimes use the, the rhetoric of human rights to struggle for their territories, for instance. To say their territory, the right to the territory because their identity is their territory. So when you consider that a, a territory can be human rights, territories are never considered uh, the human rights in the Declaration of 1948, but in a sense they expand the concept of uh, human rights in a kind of an intercultural world. Uh, and in fact, my first paper on this was toward an intercultural conception of human rights uh, that was published by Verso Book, Universal Books, Another Knowledge is Possible. That was at the beginning of the 2000s. So the idea of the counter hegemony is the idea that sometimes the only tool available to you is are the tools of the oppressor, but you subvert them. Uh, for instance, you say that you are doing democracy, but it's not liberal democracy. It's direct democracy. It's a, a, a deliberative or participatory democracy. But I never use them in isolation. I always think that in social struggles, particularly in, the, in which I have been participating, we see also what I call the ruined seeds. Ruined seeds is a composite word, concept, of something that is dead, ruined, and something that is emerging, seed. Uh, and I consider one of the most fruitful concepts that I've developed, uh, because I have seen that in my and my uh, research and, and uh, political work, uh, people go to concepts that in fact are long gone in a sense they were pre-colonial concepts, like the, the concept of Pachamama, 
Usually these uh, ruins cannot be formulated in colonial languages, only non-colonial languages. Pachamama is Mother Earth, is, um, is the idea that uh, the land and nature is our mother. Uh, and this is a ruin because uh, uh, except for Spinoza, uh, we in the West uh, forgot about the idea that uh, nature is our mother. On the contrary, nature is disposable, is a res extensa in Descartes, right? So uh, I think that this ruin is now being uh, activated by the indigenous movement, by Afro-descendant movement, by ecologists now as a seed, as a, a narrative of uh, emancipation. I see the youth, uh, uh, ecological youth in, uh, in the cities uh, uh, talking about Pachamama. They don't even know Quechua. Quechua Pachamama is a Quechua word, but that's not important. What they, what they have a sense is that they identify with a concept that in a sense uh, brings nature into ourselves because nature is ourselves, it's because it's our mother. Uh, the idea that there is a separation between humanity and nature is the most detrimental separation of Western modernity. Of course, uh, we are not separate because we cannot say anything without our nature, without our bodies like, like the ones here uh, that we are performing. So ruined seeds is always the other tool that very often is used uh, we in conjunctions with counter hegemonic instruments. And, and then liberated zones. Liberated zones are zones where, in fact, people, particularly young people today, perform the future. They don't wait for the future. They perform it now. And they use other forms like the quilombos that were governed by other rules other than the slave owner rules. They have other rules. Rojava is a very good example of a Brazil liberated zone. And uh, the, the Zapatistas in uh, the Selva de la Candona and Chiapas is also a very good example of liberated zones. But they are communes. Communes in Berlin, I don't know in Vienna, but in, in Berlin you can see the communes and so on, collectives that are being organized uh, around uh, other struggles that decommodify your life. That is to say, you don't depend on the market. You depend on uh, things that you can do yourself and work together with others in kind of cooperation and not in competition, uh, like the you know neoliberalism calls you to do. So this counter hegemony is uh, only part of a broader repertoire of struggles, and it should never be used in isolation, because it's usually the first stage, you know that when you are in a struggle, you one principle that you learn is that the terms of the struggle are usually established by the oppressor, by the stronger part. And we have to play with those rules. Because if you don't play with those rules, you are out. You may be pretty simple, you can be excluded, totally excluded, or assassinated. So I think we start with those terms, and then we change the terms of the struggle with ruined seats and with liberated zones. So it is a kind of a process uh, which is more subtle and more complex than the usually uh, conceptions of resistance. I understand you, yes. Um, and talking about Pachamama and these concepts and different kinds of knowledges and knowledges that are maybe lost or not known in, yeah, especially in the global north. Um, you mentioned also the intercultural translation, and and this is also a very important work. This, um, yeah, that has to be done. And uh, you mentioned, for example, um, people in in the Western civilization. Uh, um, do not see, for example, the river as a person. And uh, you mentioned this, I believe, in a lecture. And um, this is a funny, funny thing that because uh, we in the Western uh, capitalist societies, but we accept that uh, transnational corporations are juridical ur ur persons. So, <laughs> so on, you, you can see that, uh, yeah, there are similarities. But we do not accept uh, their knowledge and their worldview. So, 
um, yeah, so so this is the, the tricky part, how to translate, how to overcome these different knowledges and how to to pick up the yeah, the best what is out there. Uh, and because seeing the river as a person and a yeah, accepting Joseph, it, it, this is important yeah. also for us because we are destroying our planet, you know, with the yeah, with the climate emergency. We are also the elites. I mean, I, are they blind or, or they are destroying the futures of their children as well? They are not only... Okay, I, I understand. We are the subhumans. They dominate us. Okay, I'm fine with that. But where is the logic to to, <laughs> to cut their own... Uh, uh, how, how can I say? <laughs> where you sit yes. on. <laughs> yeah, that's right. No, it's, it's really um, what I've been, uh, you know, struggling with is... It's always a question, our innovative thinking, or whatever it is, uh, um, in my case, not an avant-garde, but a rear-guard intellectual. I always consider myself rear-guard, not avant-garde, because I learned a lot from the movements, is that our, our creativity is very much connected with the power that we have, the ones that stick. I mean, the idea that why uh, the, the transnational companies are persons, well, it's a fiction, in fact, a fiction that comes from Roman law. Uh, and it has been accepted. We have created the idea they are not physical persons, but they are juridical persons, they are legal persons. Well, why not a river? Because the people that have been struggling for uh, the rivers to have, or a mountain, uh, to have, uh, you know, rights, um, are not powerful enough to do so, because they are indigenous people, they are peasants. Uh, they are Afro descendants. Uh, they are. They have been excluded from uh, the norm of development. Uh, they don't believe in development because development has been for them a way of destroying their uh, lives and so on. Uh, therefore, they don't have power. And the reason why we are now talking about this is because of the ecological crisis. There is to say the reason why in New Zealand. Uh, you have a law now that, in fact, has granted rights to this river, the sacred river of the Maori. Uh, we have the same laws in India now and in, in, in Colombia, but in, in New Zealand it's particularly strong because uh, it has awarded millions of dollars to revive the river, uh, the margins of the river, the ecosystems of the river. Uh, and, in fact, the, this human right of the river, uh, as a person, the guardians of that uh, right are the indigenous people themselves. So this is a major change in our jurisprudence. And in fact, in a book that is coming out by Cambridge Law and the Epistemologists of the South, I have a long chapter on the river, precise on the question of, uh, of uh, juridical perspective personality of the river and so on absolutely important um um so one question that is also touching me and myself um because um you are for example critical of the frankfurt school and postmodernist and so on and so forth but you are quoting them many times for example or the other critique is that, for example, I published last year this anthology with a, a colleague of mine, Leo Gabriel, and um, my mother, uh, even today, did not and cannot read it because she do not understand what, I, <laughs> what I'm talking about. So, And the same problem I can see in your books, um, especially uh, the epistemologic, uh, uh, epistemologists of the South, uh, also in the in the seminar we discussed it. Uh, you address that this book is for the subaltern, this book is for the oppressed, this book is for the peasantry, and so on and so forth. But to be quite honest, they cannot understand you because you are quoting Hegel. You are co you know that the concepts are even for me. I I am now working on my PhD, and and even for me, it's it's tough. You know, I have to read one or two, three times maybe and to grasp the whole concept and idea so <laughs> can you react to to my problem with my book but also uh can you can you answer the critique uh also that applies to you 
Well, it's 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 a problem of, of, of we as intellectuals. This is a problem that all of us face. In fact, I'd like to see your book because you mentioned uh, is by any sense is Leo Gabriel that you mentioned. Leo Gabriel. Yeah. Well, he's a good friend of mine. Uh, his uh, father. Leo no, uh, I wrote it with his son. This is his son, uh, Junior. Uh, yeah, his son. I, so I'm a friend of the father. I'm a friend <laughs> of the father. Oh, nice one. We have been together in the World Social Forum. Uh, I see. That's very interesting. So, no, that's true. That, that's true. That, yeah, that's why uh, I have um, in my probably the most uh, revolutionary aspect uh, of the decolonizing the university work and the epistemology of the South is that I say something that people usually they listen to, but they don't take it seriously and they become very resentful, actually is that I say that if you are really going to be serious and uh, consistent with your epistemologies of the South, then you should spend 50% of your time at the university and 50% of your time in the struggles with people. So why is that? Well, in part, because I think that in fact, it's our responsibility, it's a privilege today to be in a university and uh, is a way of uh, uh, trying to share this not because people really like uh, uh, and they need and they need uh, academic knowledge it's, it's stupid to think that people in in the movements they disregard academic uh, knowledge uh, on on the contrary uh, i can tell you an interesting story i was in el alto which is a city in uh, in bolivia uh, on top of La Paz, and uh, and uh, the women were discussing for almost an hour because it was a it was a discussion among women, and I was I had been invited. There's a, a huge organization of women in Bolivia uh, called the Bartolina Caesars, and uh, these Bartolinas were discussing, uh, and they were really insulting each other uh, because of the cooperating or, or not with the previous government, and they were. Uh, uh, you know, insulting each other, and the insult usual was, "You are a neoliberal." They said, "No, I'm not. You are a neo neoliberal. You are a neoliberal," and so on. There was a discussion almost for an hour, and all of a sudden, the president uh, addresses me. I was listening to that. I said, "Professor Boventura, please tell us what, what is neoliberalism." And all of a sudden, I was, you know, of course, I was surprised by the question. It was a wonderful question. And I said, you know, I said, what was neoliberalism? What I thought that was neoliberalism, I said, the most recent version of capitalism. And I said, well, from, from this, I can assure you that none of you are neoliberals. You are not neoliberals in any way. It is in a way of insulting each other because you are fighting for cooperation, for a better society. Uh, for harmony, for anti-capitalism. So it's not neoliberalism. So academic knowledge as a place, it's a very important place. Oh, how can you do that? We are transitional period. people, as I'm, I call my the, the epistemology of the South. The epistemology of the South are transitional because they exist only because there are epistemologies of the North. If there was no epistemologies of the North dominating our universities, well, we shouldn't need the the uh, the, the epistemologies of the South. If you could invite people from uh, other walks of life to come to your university, teach, work with your students, doing seminars and so on, people that have ideas about different things, with whom you can and you know really disagree. Some of them are quite reactionary sometimes, right? But you. You have to interact. What I have come to the conclusion is impossible to do that in academic life. And that's why I think that we have to be outside there. But, but my books, in fact, are addressed to the academic uh, community because they are the ones. It's not because they don't understand what I, I read, what I write, is, is that they cannot afford buying the books. They cannot even afford buying the books. Um, so I also publish chronicles in newspapers. For instance, I have columns that sometimes are in Spanish, Portuguese, or English, and um, try to make some things of uh, more accessible and so on. It's another strategy. But in fact, the academic uh, 
uh, life today if you you have to play the game in academic life because if you are going to particularly if you are a younger scholar and if you don't quote uh, certain authors and so on uh, you know the referees don't allow your uh, so we have to resist within the academic life but this is a contradiction we cannot we have to live with the contradiction not to supersede it and i live with that contradiction myself absolutely i can see that in myself and um also uh, you talked about kind of lib- uh, kind of uh, cannibalization of the university uh and i can yeah i i see it in my personal life because together with a colleague and friend of mine we applied uh separately uh for rosa luxemburg research uh, funding and uh then we asked each other okay let's proofread uh each other in order to to get better and then to to minimize the the, the errors and so on and then suddenly um uh he said to me but uh we cannot be chosen uh, both <laughs> and so and then it it start hitting me like a you know like a <laughs> uh like a slap in in the face and and yeah he was right we are in this game uh enemies and and we are in a in a you know um yeah it was ugly it was an ugly situation uh, but we proved to re- read each other and and it was a productive um and and soli- with with full of solidarity and so on and uh, both we didn't get it <laughs> so it it doesn't matter anyway but uh but it shows how uh, yeah it it's so cruel it is nasty and then you have to to get rid of your you know in order to get a fellowship uh, in order to get the 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 funding and and so on and so forth so you need to be in this machine uh citing yourself 100 times <laughs> in order to get the ranking up and and many other things and and we know that and yeah it's it's a tough game it's a tough game academia is a tough game yeah. and um yeah so okay we mentioned everything and the colonial universities so maybe uh ah uh, yes i have a question on on twitter uh the bulgarian researcher georgi stankov sent me uh the message the following uh, the following question um i am interested in what similarities and differences professor santos finds between decolonialization and the sovietization uh, respectively, the process in post-colonial and post-Soviet societies uh, and the extent to which former colonial powers uh, try to influence their uh, former processions. Uh, so uh, are there similarities or, or, and differences? What is your opinion on that well, question? There are definitely. That, I don't know. Well, I, I have read something about that, but, you know, it's not a topic that I have dealt with in... Uh, in uh, in great detail, uh, but in fact there are there are uh, similarities. There are similarities, of course. Uh, the problem is that uh, you know uh, it depends on what you consider. I mean, the, the ways in which when when I was in Ju- I was never been in Bulgaria, but I was in what was called then the East Germany, or, the, or democratic Germany, as you uh, it was the Soviet. Uh, 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 example, uh, 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 Republic then, uh, at the time of Walter Ulbricht. Uh, and in fact, we could see that that was, a, you know, the, the Soviet presence was absolutely oppressive in my, in my view, in my, in my reading of, of things. Uh, and uh, was it a colonial uh, situation? Well, uh, you know, that, that, concept uh, didn't didn't come alive at then there was you know because we were colonialism was reserved for the the european colonies outside europe uh, but we are not aware at the time that there is internal colonialism in europe uh, that northern europe has always dealt with the southern europe in a colonial way uh, and we when we saw the crisis in greece we could see that the german newspapers dealt with the Greeks as if they were colonial subjects, in a sense. They were lazy. They didn't know how to govern themselves. And so they used lots of colonial prejudices 
uh, I was reading Der Spiegel and I was really astonished. And they did that with Portugal, they did that with, uh, you know, with Spain and so on. Well, in that case, uh, uh, in East uh, Germany, in, East, uh, in, in the, the former Soviet group, I have seen uh, lots of uh, different attitudes. I mean, in fact, very critical uh, of, of the regime. At the same time, um, why Marx is widely read now in that regions in the former Soviet uh, countries, um, and I don't understand. I'd like to know more. You, and, and probably your your uh, uh, listener could uh, uh, could help us because it's quite contradictory. Uh, because it was an oppressive system, uh, but th there was no unemployment. They had free housing. They have uh, education and so on. I was in Macedonia very recently. Was part of Yugoslavia, uh, and I was there in, in Skopje, and and we were discussing precisely this, the ambivalence. We want our freedom, we want democracy, but you know, what we would like to would be a kind of a social social democracy. But the problem is that Europe is, you know, is doing away with social democracy. As the extreme right governs uh, Europe, the social democracy will not survive. So that's the contradiction going on. Call it a colonial situation, it's quite, Polemical. I would, uh, I would need more reflection on that. Uh, to could be a simplistic way uh, um, of uh, of uh, of analyzing it, and I don't want to to do that uh, out of respect for for our uh, for our colleague. Absolutely, yeah, I understand. Um, so let's move on to the last topic. Um, I know it's uh, uncomfortable, um, but um, um, yeah. Uh, um, I'm in a very ugly and uncomfortable situation as well because, uh, you know, I'm in a position that I'm not involved. I'm n not interested really, but I have to speak about it um, uh, because also in the in the philosophical seminar, as um, as we approached the end, um, she got the message that there was some academic misconduct, uh, and then we we stopped reading you. So it is also a difficult in academia as well. So. Um, and I'm not a big fan of of cancel culture. I'm I'm, I'm more uh, uh, on the direct approach. If you are, have a problem, face it. Let's talk about it and and get rid of it. But yeah. um, okay, because and my ugly situation is because if you are innocent and the accusations are wrong, I'm asking tough questions and you know I'm putting dirt on your name and and I'm, maybe I offend you and and it's it's ugly. On the other side, if <laughs> If the accusations are wrong, I apologize, and uh, if they are, are right, and um, so I do unjust to the victim. So on either side, I am in in the baddest in <laughs> in the in the in the worst seat. But anyways, uh, uh, the 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 problem lies there, uh, as far as I can see. Uh, in April, there has been accusations of sexual harassment and exploitation of labor. Um, uh, there, the, these alleged cases were reported uh, also in publications. Um, then there was this division, like I said in the beginning, more than 250 people uh, signed a manifesto to support the accusations. On the other hand, many intellectuals and, and researchers and prestigious people like Adolfo Perez Esquivel, um, Esquivel uh, signed a manifesto in support of, of you, of your position. And... Uh, so there is a, a in academia a, a big discussion going on and uh, a friend of mine Juliana who I very much respect and uh, she also had a bad experience with hierarchies and and especially if you're a woman so I understand the position of the weaker and as we talked about now for more than one hour hierarchies every in my opinion everywhere and we are not yeah um fully aware sometimes of it so maybe you know we do something we say something that we didn't meant that you know at the other end it was received badly or the miscommunication so there are many things many layers so but there is this discussion so first of all um yeah what is your reaction i mean Okay, Joseph, your, your, your video is a trap because uh, I never thought that someone would ask me about that. 
uh, and I couldn't uh, answer. Um, but it's very interesting that you, and because I could have told you now that question, we are not going to touch at that question. And for a very simple reason, uh, my center is organized an independent commission to, uh, to deal with these issues. And uh, let's wait for the final report. Um, and, uh, and uh, you know, that's the end of, it could be just the end of the conversation, right? Uh, why is it not? Uh, and I'd like to probably uh, uh, to honor you, and, and it's not what uh, uh, what you expect probably to say. Well, of course, I uh, there is a, a division now in the feminist movement, a very serious division between those that uh, uh, follow uh, the Me Too uh, type of uh, movement that was born in the United States. And the idea is what uh, toleration zero, that is to say, a denunciation is the same as a condemnation, uh, cancellation, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Well, uh, for the past 35 years, I spent half year in the United States, and I taught during the period of Me Too. I was never accused of anything at uh, my misconduct there, uh, uh, so I was taken aback for this paper that was published by Routledge, a very offensive paper. And uh, I can tell you that the, the, the book is already suspended temporarily because it's so serious, because it's really a very, is a criminal accusation under the guise of a scientific uh, paper. And, uh, we have to distinguish genuine struggles. And, uh, you know, I, I think I'm, I'm being a feminist all my life. That's why heteropatriarchy is part of domination. Many people never believe that I should uh, equate heteropatriarchy with class or, or, or race. And I did. And I tried to be consistent. But we are never totally consistent. You know that, right? And a person of my generation, of course, uh, particularly in the past, committed certain act, acts, incorrect errors, but never crimes, that is to say, you know, incorrect things that would be considered male chauvinistic things that, for instance, today you are uh, particularly beautiful. Uh, you are very well dressed. Well, this is something that they cannot say today, but in 2010, uh, 2000, probably I could say, and it was not offensive. Uh, and that so there is really a change in the styles of society and we have to respect that we have to go with our time and there are just struggles the inequalities of power are absolutely general in all academic life and i've been fighting against that the problem is when you have in the middle of a, a just struggle a very unjust in my view process and why do I say that? And now you are start saying that, well, here is Bo Ventura going to defend himself. Now, what I'm telling you is uh, some hard facts that just, uh, because it's just facts, and facts that I, I'll, uh, I'll, uh, I'll convey to the commission. First of all, the, the main author of that uh, paper, that paper is uh, a person, a Belgian researcher that we expelled from our center. We have to do a, a kind of a disciplinary process against this woman because of misconduct at, uh, at our research center. And she promised a revenge when she left. She said that to some colleagues. She said, well, revenge. And because she even, it was very serious because uh, uh, all the accusations that she did was really out of the way. That, she wanted names of informants in Guatemala, in Latin America, for her research. And it's something that we cannot do. We have to do it by research. Uh, they, they have to find them for themselves, right? Uh, but this woman was really, uh, is really a, a person of, uh, of this type of misconduct. And she made a complaint against the European Union because it was a Marie Curie grant. And the complaint is public. And, uh, and if you read that complaint, that complaint is almost reproduced in the book, uh, in the paper. 
So it is really uh, something very serious uh, that may reflect, uh, of course, uh, irregularities that are at my center. But I was not even director of the center. Since 2010, I'm not director. I'm scientific director. I'm not, uh, I'm not even the executive director. So to put everything on the star professor, so we have the assembled. I can share, send you lots of material, lots of protests against this type of strategy that in fact, I think is again another case of misconduct. I don't know where the referees for that article were because you know, if you read the article, you can see that the bibliography has nothing to do with the empirical part of the paper because the empirical part of the paper is based on what they call the, the whisper network. And they never did an interview with the people there. They never asked, uh, how could I be? If I were, I spent in the last uh, uh, 20 years, probably, I don't spend at my center uh, more than uh, four or three months per year. How could I be the center of so many things that uh, they are, you know, uh, attributed? It's really a very, uh, in fact, a very male chauvinistic uh, type of paper because uh, there is a figure that is mentioned there called watch woman, as if the researchers, women researchers, do not value, have no value by themselves. Uh, the value is by the connections they have with male researchers. Okay, I mean, there are many cases of that. I've seen that. But you cannot generalize without any information, empirical information. So there is no empirical evidence there. So the empirical evidence are these facts. So I'm going to show to the commission, so I can't go into that now, uh, more than this, uh, that to show that in fact, all these accusations, I can give you a bit more context because then it will be sound. But what about someone that visited your center in 2010 and then that she was sequestered and so on and to, I attempt to violate her or rape her or something. Well, this is a complete invention. I was in Chile, uh, Joseph, and I was quite, uh, you, know, uh, you know, I don't know what to think about that because I, I didn't remember the, the woman at all. So I, I mentioned, I immediately called my secretary and said, look at the documents, uh, the, all the emails exchanged. Hey, I don't know if you have seen my refutation of those accusations. I have, uh, you know, distribute them is a complete refutation. The problem is that sometimes even people don't read the refutation anymore, because if you are in toleration zero, the enunciation is what counts. I mean, it, it, it's not true. Uh, I think we have to see the facts also. So what what is said there, my refutation is complete. I mean, this woman was in communication with me in, uh, to, until 2014, and she said that she never uh, uh, communicate with me. Uh, she said that uh, the place where I took her was my a, a restaurant of my own family. Well, I have the, the ticket of the bill of the restaurant. It's a very famous restaurant in, in the town. 2010. I mean, you know, this is quite an invention. Why is that? Why all this comes out, particularly at this point? Well, this is not, what I'm going to tell you now is not a fact. Uh, this is a suspicion. And I'm probably speaking more since you are, I, I liked your interview in good faith. And uh, I'm probably telling you more than I should at this stage uh, because we are before uh, the commission is going to start, I hope very soon. But what I see is the disproportion of this uh, scandal in spite of my refutations and everything. Uh, and I saw that some cases, for instance, here in Portugal, there are cases of real sexual assault or harassment at universities, and they never mention the name of the person. They say at the University of Oporto, a professor has been accused of sexual harassment, this and that. Well, in my case, we were named photo days and days after. Why was that? Only because I'm a famous social scientist? 
only because I'm widely read in different languages? Well, I have to give you some of my suspicion. I'm the almost only voice in Portugal against the war in Ukraine, against the continuation. I was very much against the illegal invasion of Ukraine by Russia. But from then on, I became, because I lived in the United States for so long, that I know that this war was provoked by the United States. It is a provocation in order to really try to neutralize Russia and basically to try to neutralize China. And therefore, it's a proxy war that is going to destroy Ukraine. And you can see how even cluster bombs are being now proposed in that region. So I'm, believe it or not, I am almost the only one known figure, public figure, saying this in the press. And I have been insulted a lot, insulted by people because I'm a pacifist, because I'm pro-Russia. Uh, I was not never a member of the Communist Party. <laughs> so that's my luck, because even they think that Putin is communist. But this is extreme right guy. I mean, nothing to do with this guy. But the problem is that what I was saying was quite scandalous. And I think there was an interest in shutting up my voice. And in fact, my voice now is shut. I'm, I'm probably can, my, publishing my chronicles, but not in the major newspapers as I used to do. I don't know if this has anything to do with the disproportion of the scandal, because there were other motives, because the feminist movement is divided and the younger generation of the feminists, uh, they have sometimes the idea uh, that the man is the enemy. Uh, as you mentioned before, this is very clear in many, uh, particularly younger generation. I have to understand them as a sociologist. I have to, exp and I have to say that uh, uh, I even wrote a document of self-criticism saying that, well, in the past there were some errors, but you know, never this type of crime, how could I ever do these kinds of things? So this is preposterous and um, uh, it has been used against me because I was uh, out of this uh, revenge, I would say, of this woman, because it was addressed to me while in fact I was, let me a moment because it's my phone. I have just to close it. So Joseph, that, uh, that's what I have to tell you, probably more than I should, because um, now we'll have an independent commission. Probably the report won't be before the end of the year. And um, I'm returning to my books and so on. But of course, this cancellation has created a late of suffering to me. Um, uh, and, um, and of course, has damaged my reputation now. Uh, and uh, I, um, I rely on friends, um, many feminists, uh, you know, from Argentina, very good friends of mine, Rita Segato, Gina Vargas, many people that I know have told me, man, we are against cancellation because nobody knows my position on this. Joseph, my, I have never talked about the cases except my reputation. And I mentioned this because I, I told you I, I published that. All the other cases that I'll mention, I'll, I'll have my facts, I have the documents, I have the emails, everything is documented. I, 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 I really, I'm very at peace with me uh, and whatever happened, quite frankly. What I'm not saying that there are no irregularities in my center, but not with me. And that they should be investigated. They should be, of course, investigated. What we don't understand, one of the authors even, uh, another author mentioned to someone that in fact the paper was not intended to be against uh, Professor Santos because we admire him 
and so on. But then the final version was by this Belgian researcher and she put everything on top of the professor and uh, because it was this the idea of revenge. So it's very unfortunate uh, is uh, we are in a period that besides we were discussing how we are being divided uh, at this point uh, and usually are people on the left that uh, are subject to this type of thing. So we are destroying critical knowledge. A lot of us are, look what happened to Tariq Ramadan, for instance, you know, five years, uh, but it was a judicial case, it was probably very serious. My case has nothing to do with the courts, but it's a mediatic situation. Uh, many people write me and say, well, Bo, uh, you know, this is very unfortunate to be up with you and so on. And we go on reading and, and so on. And I think that I'm very at peace with the results of the commission. And uh, I hope that Routledge reconsider what they did because Routledge published five books by me, uh, two singular books and two collective books. So they, the, they themselves are a bit puzzled by the quality of this chapter. But as I say, and I want to emphasize, the struggle against in an equal power within the academic life is a very just struggle. And much more has to be done in that case. And uh, I'm ready in, in my self-criticism, I say, well, that's I want to collaborate with, which I've been doing in my center, quite frankly. But then all of a sudden, there is this betrayal with this trap, in a sense, that was used for different purposes in different parts of the world. So I have to rely on my friends, on the, the trust that uh, I know at peace with my conscience, and uh, relying on the commission and waiting calmly for that. But uh, Joseph, uh, I have to tell you, with much psychic suffering, because uh, consolation, not being able to go to the newspaper and say, oh, this is my position. Because they say, no, but your position, but the, the woman position is always the prevailing one. Um, I, I think, think that in 19% of the cases, they may be right, but sometimes they are wrong. So I have to separate the issues to consider the just struggles, but be very much against the unjust ones. And it so happened that I have been really targeted for different reasons by an unjust and a deep injustice against me. And I hope that uh, truth will prevail. It will take some time, it will prevail, but uh, uh, this is a part of our life of our world. And I have to be a sociologist of my own time. And um, I don't have a party to protect me. I don't have a church to protect me. I don't have a social, a secret society protect me, as sometimes in the past happened. So I'm there, I'm out there, uh, at this point very lonely, uh, but at the same time, enjoying that you, Josef, uh, uh, engage with me in the conversation. We had a wonderful conversation, and uh, we had to. I never expect that you would touch that question. But you know, I could have told you uh, before of the say that question, not Joseph, because it's under uh, under investigation. But I enjoy the conversation with you, and I think that you'd probably like to have my at least my feelings. You can have absolutely the date, the documents that are presented to the commission that show the facts of the situation. Uh, but at least you get the feeling how I feel uh, about this. And uh, and I, I can't say more about that. Quite absolutely, fine. absolutely. And I thank you for your honesty. And um, yeah, I see it in, in our culture. For example, the Julian Assange uh, was also charged by rape and so on and so forth. But the Swedish government dropped and the, the, the whole investigation. So it was just, uh, yeah, we saw it with Julian Assange. Then we saw this famous um, Johnny Depp case uh, where her yeah, girlfriend, wife, uh, has mental, she's mental ill. So 
and and many feminists um, from the beginning on oh he's a rapist no cancel him don't give him a job uh, he should never appear on television and 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 so on and so forth i hear the debate in my leftist bubble and i can see the division between feminists and 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 yeah i i see their point and and i see that patriarchy is everywhere and and we are men and we are not free from guilt i understand it and we profit from this system and so their struggle is also our struggle i see that but sometimes on a personal level yeah maybe the yeah there is confusion and also i understand it that especially if you are left wing and and maybe you have positions that are not comfortable for the mainstream media like for example you mentioned the ukraine war and i saw that uh, here in vienna there was a big conference a uh, peace conference um and the left uh, liberal newspaper standard uh, turned the things around and and they yeah it was also a, 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 a small scandal but anyways yeah so i thank you for your honesty and uh, as you said i believe i read it somewhere that you opened up and you published also the emails mm, between you and mm, maria ivana moira ivana milan and and yeah, the debate is going on. So there are professors like Pablo Olivade, Angeles Castano, and Oledia Hernandez, as well as Pablo Davalos, who questioned the accusations. Were, but then there are also yeah Brazilian Congresswoman Bella uh, Gonçalves, who announced yeah. that yeah she can she can feel it, and and she's also been assaulted. So. Yeah, I, I do not understand well, why about that. I have also the emails, uh, Joseph. I'm going to present emails, facts, documents, and nothing else. I yeah. One day we'll, we'll know more about this one day. Probably now it's impossible to know more. Thank you. Okay. Thank you for your openness. Thank you for the long uh, also theoretical discussions. I enjoyed your book. I am like always critical. <laughs> But uh, this is fine. And uh, yeah, thank you for, for answering the questions in, in depth. And um, yeah, I wish you a pleasant day a and uh, hope we stay in contact. And I hope that you send me the link of this uh, conversation, can you then? Of course, of course, of, of course. Your YouTube of course, okay. of course. Thank you. Thank Bye. you. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye, Joseph.